are going to take you guys on a bit of a journey today, bringing a Ferrari to a horse race, going from background jobs to event-driven microservices with RabbitMQ. Uh, before we do that, already an excellent introduction. I don't have a lot of things to add, but hi, I am Sophie DiBenedetto. I'm a senior engineer at GitHub, co-author of Programming Phoenix Live View, and uh, I'm also a co-host of the Beam Radio podcast along with uh, my co-presenter today, Stephen, and we were super excited to be media sponsors of RabbitMQ Summit this year. And um, I do want to give a shout out and just say hello to uh, Adolfo and Mac Bull, who were the um, like lottery award winners of the ticket giveaway we did through Beam Radio. So welcome, guys. And uh, obviously, a shout out to our other Beam Radio co-hosts as well. Um, but kind of what brings me here today, what we'll be talking a lot about is uh, the work that I did in my previous position at the Flatiron School together with Steven, where we relied on RabbitMQ a whole lot. Um, and of course, no presentation of mine, as some of you guys may know, is complete without a picture of my dog looking normal in the sunshine, as he is wont to do. Um, but let me hand it over to Steven to introduce himself a little bit further. Awesome. Yeah, that was a really great introduction um, already, but I'm a senior engineer at GitHub currently. Um, formerly a developer at the Flatiron School. This talk will focus on some of the work we did at the Flatiron School. Um, and as Sophie said, co-host of Beam Radio. Uh, make sure you check it out. Uh, there at, at the Flatiron School, we designed a messaging infrastructure system uh, and supporting libraries. I also have a dog. He is also, also very cute. Steven, um, well, let's see your dog. And me. So you don't sound or look very good, and there's like a lot of interference. Can um, you? Uh, yeah, let me let me try something more. Something about that. All right, bear with us, guys. All right, technical difficulties. One second. Yeah. Oh god, so embarrassing, right? How unprofessional of us. Oh my goodness, look who it is. Oh hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, is this better? Can you guys hear me? Okay. No thumbs up. I'll no, take that as a yes. Yeah, okay. Well, sure. thank you for bearing with yeah. us for our extremely cheesy bit. Um, but we were so excited about this talk that we actually use it as an opportunity to get together for the first time yeah. since, you know, pre-pandemic now that everyone is vaccinated. So hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. And welcome to my apartment, which is where we all are. And I think we can uh, continue from here. Let's keep going. Okay, so what are we going to do today in the next, I don't know, 40 minutes or so? We are going to convince you that RabbitMQ is the perfect backbone for a robust, performant, scalable, and maintainable event-driven system. I know there's a lot of buzzwords in that, but I promise you that we're going to back it up with some of our real experiences. We're going to take you on our journey from using RabbitMQ as an incredibly powerful background job processor to a message broker underlying what became a pretty complex distributed system. So RabbitMQ is the Ferrari that we brought to the background job processing horse race, but it ended up uh, being a good thing for us because pretty soon we needed to drive a Ferrari. Um, and we will also tell you what we learned about working with and managing RabbitMQ in production along the way, since I know that that is uh, something that's definitely on the mind of a lot of our audience members. Um, I'm just gonna ask, everyone to mute if you're not muted yet. I do hear some typing. Um, I think it might be John, but I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, so a little bit more about what we'll cover today. Four topics that we're gonna dig into. Um, a little bit of our experiences working with RabbitMQ as a background job processor. We'll talk about why we chose RabbitMQ for our event-driven system. We'll talk about how we designed that system using RabbitMQ. And then lastly, I think the thing that we're perhaps the most excited to not shill, but share with you is how RabbitMQ and the Beam specifically benefited the system that we had architected. All right, handing it over to Steven, RabbitMQ yeah. as a background jobs processor. Very cool, I think I can try. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about this uh, application that we built at learn.co. Um, it was a tool to support students learning, uh, particularly to learn programming concepts. And we tried to focus on building a ton of social and um, sort of live feedback features into it. I just want to show you guys a little bit of what this thing looked like. Um, so there was a place for you to manage your progress through your curriculum. We had an in-browser IDE you could hold on to. Uh, we also had ways of allowing students interactions on their local terminals to have uh, updates on the on the UI for them, which is really great. Uh, in addition, we also had 
some social features, like I said, how many discussion questions you've proposed, your learning streak. Don't judge me. I hadn't, I hadn't done it in a while. Um, but also a feature that was surprisingly good at making students uh, very competitive was the activity uh, stream. If you saw that somebody opened an assignment before you, it was sort of like, uh, you know, a badge of honor or a badge of rage inducing um, action that would make you kind of like work faster, which is kind of interesting. Uh, some of the architecture, uh, we would get uh, events and messages from different parts of the, from different systems, essentially, GitHub, Stripe, they would come into some one application that we had that its job was solely to take those messages and then convert them to rabid messages, get those into rabid MQ. We then have an, uh, the web worker, the worker side of our application, subscribe to certain topics and channels, uh, to certain topics rather, um, and then work, uh, commit to some work there, pretty standard uh, setup. Uh, one other thing that we did was we would also, as I mentioned, support uh, taking in events from when a student worked on something on their machine. They ran tests, they committed their code, and that would post to our sort of ingress system, push that over to Rabbit, update a web worker. Um, at the time we built this, it was a Ruby on Rails application, and uh, we wanted some live interactive features, and Rabbit really helped us to do that um, quite a bit along with Nginx push stream. So a message would come in on Rabbit, it would hit a worker. We would then uh, push a message through push stream, which would update the, the browser sessions. So that's when we got activity monitoring. We got red lights for when you ran the tests, but it failed, the green lights when you passed all the tests. And it was also a very motivating uh, bit of work there. Um, but Rabbit definitely made it possible to uh, take a relatively simple concept of background jobs, but then also we knew we could be on the reliability and the scalability that Rabbit gave us. Yeah, and it really like it brought real time to this web app in a time when WebSockets, if anyone can remember back that far, were like not really a first class citizen right. in your web framework. So this was in a Ruby on Rails monolith, and this was even before what is it? In? Significantly before yeah, Action Cable. Action Cable, way before that. Right. Certainly before Phoenix. If anybody has like an Elixir background. Um, so Rabbit was really the key to bringing that real-time set of interactivity. Right. So some of the workflows were, you know, you would, a student would run tests, it would post to the endpoint, it would publish to Rabbit. You would finish an activity, so finish an assignment or join a study group, publish to Rabbit. Uh, GitHub sent us an event, it would eventually wind up on Rabbit. Uh, we would have cron jobs that would run, throw that on Rabbit, you get it. Everything goes on Rabbit. Um, what was interesting is that the way we set it up early on sort of to support this flexibility that Rabbit gave us, it forced us into dealing with a distributed system already. We have this ingress application that would process those web hooks and other events into Rabbit messages. Um, and there were some things that weren't great about our original setup. One of them was, uh, well, networks are hard in general. We originally started by managing our own Rabbit cluster um, and that was uh, not great. Uh, we wound up running into all the problems that you get when you deal with networks in general. So networks are the, are the enemy. We had tons of split brain issues, um, which really quickly is when the, a clustered node cannot communicate with another node, it thinks it's down. So it becomes the primary. And then you wind up getting a situation where they're both competing for who is the source of truth. Not great to deal with and, and, uh, and reconcile. Um, and then also upgrading the system became really hard too, because this is a critical bit of system uh, of hardware that requires a highly managed um, upgrade step. Uh, I'm happy to hear that Cloud AMQP is a sponsor of it. They did not pay me to say this. We actually did wind up migrating to Cloud AMQP and had a really great time uh, working with that. It was my favorite day when we could shut down our rabbit cluster yes, oh because we knew it was, it was going to be handled and upgrades were easy and it was really, really great. Well, it's a nice compliment to our darkest day or one of our darkest days, which was um, debugging what ended up being caused by the split brain. I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I just remember getting into the office to find you and another colleague of ours like already sequestered in a conference room where we then spent the next like, I don't know, rest of my life trying to figure out what the heck was going on here. And I just remember because like we're programmers, everybody was on some sort of weird fad diet at the time. So like Josh is eating bagels like a normal person. You're doing, I think keto, so you're just eating a bowl of cream cheese. Gotta get those, you and know, I was like on an intermittent carb. fasting kick. So I'm just like drinking black coffee, which doesn't, doesn't match up with intermittent fasting. But at the time I was like, gotta get through this. So I think we yeah. really learned some hard lessons about the self-managed cluster. And, and also don't eat raw cream, just cream. Yeah, cream don't cheese. eat a bowl good. of cream cheese, which is just weird. Yeah. yeah. Delicious, but weird. It's not delicious. We'll, get to, we'll say it for Q&A. Okay. 
Um, and another thing that, that we wound up getting, running into, not necessarily tied to the networks, but the way we were using Rabbit early on was a bit of the wild, wild west, where uh, if we wanted to send a new message to an exchange, we would just sort of make up what fields we thought were good to send. This is important this time. This is important the next time. And you wound up having to duplicate that engineering effort a lot. So part of it was the infrastructure was kind of hard. And the other part was there were just no standards about you know, how we actually use Rabbit. So we already had Rabbit in place as a background job processor. We didn't really know it, but we had a distributed system. Like if you had asked us, whatever was this like three years ago, you know, do you guys have microservices or a distributed system? We would have said, no, we would have said we have a monolithic Ruby on Rails app. But even thinking back to some of the diagrams, Stephen, that you put in there, mm -hmm. it is a distributed system. We just don't manage all of the components of right. that system. We're getting input from the GitHub API, from a Stripe API, from student input, and kind of using those messages, feeding them to Rabbit so that our monolith could operate on them. So uh, we we're kind of chugging along using Rabbit. And uh, what we found, skipping over that, what we found was that we were doing really well. It was working for us as a background job processor. And we then entered into, um, at the Flatiron School, just a ton, a ton of growth. The organization was growing. Our student base was growing, our user base was growing. We opened an online program. We opened more campuses, you know, around the country and even around the world. And we started to feel the constraints of this big Ruby on Rails monolith, which I think is like a pretty common story that probably many of you guys can relate to. So we're using Rabbit, our organization grew and the monolith grows too. It gets bigger, it gets messier, it consumes more and more responsibilities. So we ended up with this app that was really hard to dev on because there were lots and lots of dependencies, different teams owning different business areas at the same time are stepping on each other's feet. There were no standards around how we were employing RapidMQ for a background job processor. So we were having to duplicate a lot of engineering effort when it came to saying that we needed to consume or handle new types of messages or new um, sources for data. So we decided to move towards what I'm describing as an intentionally distributed system because I do feel like we had like an accidentally distributed right. system. We thought we just had a monolith, but we really had a lot of moving pieces. So for example, one of the first responsibilities that we broke out of this monolith was an app to handle the billing and enrolling responsibilities for our students. Uh, a separate app to handle provisioning students with access to course materials. And I think we still had our monolith uh, up and running and that was our main educational content management system, the main interface for both teachers and students. The web UI screenshots that Steven showed you earlier were still very much in play and backed by our Ruby on Rails monolith. So in a distributed system like this, we start to find ourselves in a world in which there is no single source of truth. It used to be, even in our like accidentally distributed system, right. the monolith itself and its associated database was the single source of truth. So although we were consuming data from kind of around the world, really, you always knew that whatever the monolith told you was true. Right. But when you have students getting billed and enrolled over here and access to course materials getting provisioned over there and the main UI for students is somewhere else, there is no more single source of truth. So that's intentionally and truly distributed. Um, and we also needed these services to be able to communicate with each other. An activity in a certain service might cause an update to occur in another service. This was actually, I think, the first use case that we used Rabbit for in this distributed system. We wanted to say that enrolling a student in our Bursar enrollment billing service should have this impact on the monolith. It should make sure that the student gets added to the right cohort in our monolith Ruby on Rails app so that they can start interacting with those lessons, completing coursework. So basically overall big picture, an activity in service A would need to be communicated maybe to service B and C or B and D or C and D or whatever, you get the idea. So we evaluated a few different communication methods and they mostly fell into these two categories. We were at this point looking at synchronous versus asynchronous communication when it came to figuring out how our independent services would talk to one another. Um, so for synchronous communication, you can kind of think API driven. It's pretty familiar, um, certainly to everyone working within our organization at the time. You can use all your favorite tools to test and document your HTTP API. For that same reason, it's kind of easy to build. People already pretty much knew what they were doing when it came to making a bunch of REST endpoints. Um, you could use REST, GraphQL, gRPC, Sweet. pick your flavor. 
Um, asynchronous, on the other hand, was actually new, at least to me at the time, um, and I think a lot of other devs that we were working with, and it's an event-driven mindset. This is a world in which your publisher lets distant apps use events in new and interesting ways that the publisher doesn't care about at all. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that kind of decoupling meant for our system. Uh, in an asynchronous event-driven system, we have individual services that have local copies of data which is exactly sort of reflective of our distributed system in which there is no single source of truth. And uh, preservation of messages, even if your application is down, this is a must in a distributed world. And this is where Rabbit really came to the rescue for us. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. So we couldn't make up our minds. Obviously, you guys know what we choose because it's like we're here yeah, today yeah. to tell you all about Spoiler. it. But I'll walk you through a little bit more of our thought process before we move on and talk specifically about Rabbit. So some pitfalls of synchronous communication. Request to your system could fail if there's a failure in another system, right? They're very tightly coupled. Um, you're at the whim of networks and latency, which can be a bummer. And you might depend on systems that also need data from other systems, which again, could be cascading right. failures. That's your AB, AB, DC exactly, problem again. Exactly, all those services that need to talk to each other. So you don't just have single points of failure, you have multiple points of failure that are dependent on one another, which is scary, I think. Um, more pitfalls of synchronous communication, because I think there are more. Participants must agree on a way of authorizing requests. So we also need to figure out authorization schemas between services. Um, that's a lot more complexity and overhead, in my opinion. And we also need to make sure that services are discoverable, right? Where is the address at which I will be reaching this app over gRPC, REST, uh, GraphQL, whatever. And we also need to be able to clearly communicate contract changes between these points of communication, otherwise things break at runtime. Right. And as we just talked about, all those dependent points of failures, things breaking at runtime, super bad and disastrous. Right. All right, so all of this adds up to a super high engineering effort when it comes to spinning up new services because we have new authorization schemas, new um, network configurations to deal with. And also with all the coupling, I think it's a brittle system with a lot of points of failure. So, Async communication, on the other hand, I think has a pro for pretty much every single one of the cons that we just outlined. Um, systems are totally autonomous, so failure in A doesn't necessarily cause a failure in B. Uh, you're not really at the whim of network and latency anymore because everything ends up in Rabbit eventually. So even if things are getting delayed in terms of background job processing, you're not going to have those impacts the pages that like our students, for example, and right. our teachers are interacting with. And all the systems are decoupled. So again, a breakage in A doesn't necessarily cause a breakage in B. And uh, with some of the additional pitfalls, right? Instead of saying that you need an authorization schema, you need to bring in that complexity, maybe even a third party dependency for authorizing and authenticating users who are making these requests. Facts are emitted over a secure channel. Rabbit gives that to you and uh, you're done. So spinning up a new service similarly doesn't mean that you also need a new URL at which inter-service communication can occur because they're already discovering Rabbit. Uh, clearly communicating contract changes is also something that we were able to solve for with async communication and Rabbit because bad messages don't break your entire system system, they will delay message processing, but RabbitMQ with some other beam tricks that we'll talk about later gave us a really high degree of control over how to handle those failure scenarios so that bad messages don't break the world unless we want it to, which we sometimes do, which we'll, again, we'll talk about. All right, so moving on. There are some pitfalls of async communication. I don't want to sort of paint this rosy picture like, oh, if you just use Rabbit, everything will be fine forever. Uh, async communication requires a message broker like Rabbit, but it's not the only one, and that will add a new dependency, a new degree of complexity to your system. Uh, you're also living in a world of eventual consistency because messaging and processing those messages is async, it's not synchronous. And we also are living in a world of, quote, duplicated data, and I want to explain what I mean by that. I don't mean you have duplicated data within a particular service or component of your system. I mean that, for example, our Bursar, like billing student and enrollment app, might have versions of data that is also reflected in the student classroom management app. 
I think that's okay. I think that's appropriate. I think that's a real way of modeling the distributed domain that we were right. building for our students. Um, some data has to exist in different places when they're used differently by different pieces of your system. Yeah, I think you touched on something interesting there too. And that's the idea that the data is duplicated, but not exactly. Right. right? I may just need a name mm -hmm. for someone tied to an ID. Right. I want to just show something. You don't need the students' billing details to also right. be present in the classroom management app. Right. The billing details would only live in the Bursar app, but there might be an awareness of the student in both right. places. Right. So we have the idea of an entity that exists across all of our systems tied by some globally unique ID, mm -hmm. um, but each system has a portion of that data that it needs to do its job. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think duplicated data is like, it's succinct, but it's not totally, totally accurate or what we mean. So we felt that the benefits of async really outweighed the pitfalls and we had a secret weapon. I bet you guys can guess what it is. Uh, I, I get not, okay. nothing. Rabbit MQ. Rabbit MQ. Yes, that's it. It's Pay one. attention. Um, all right. So we chose Rabbit MQ to be the backbone of this async messaging system. And uh, the reason why is that Rabbit MQ is great, right? You guys already know this. It's a general purpose message broker. It's stable and mature. There are clients in so many different languages. You can do high availability deployments. It plays really nicely with distributed deployments. It's extremely performant. It's written in Erlang, we love the beam, but I think like the real, um, the thing that made it the deciding factor is like, look, we're, we're in a business, right? We can't always just choose the tools that we dream of using just right. in a vacuum. We were already using RabbitMQ. It was integrated into our system. We had experts, Josh, who knew how to deploy and maintain and leverage it. Uh, we already had what we needed. Right. And it really helped mitigate like that one con, that first con under async communication is you do need a message broker. It is added complexity, right. but we already had a message broker. So, and we were already so great at using it yeah. because we had gone through all these growing pains, moving from self-managed uh, to not self-managed. And it just felt like, I don't want to say a no-brainer, like it was discussed, it was talked about, but it felt like really the right fit. Uh, so on top of that, other reasons, right? I don't want to say we just used Rabbit because it was there. Uh, we really also chose it because of what we knew it could let us do. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we were excited about is getting the freedom to do language interop, which mm -hmm. is to say that we can have our brand new Elixir app because we were building a lot of Greenfield Elixir services at the time, communicate really easily to our old Ruby on Rails monolith or whatever other services might already have been in play. And there are a couple of reasons for that, right? Any async messaging infrastructure definitely opens the door to interop between services, but RabbitMQ doesn't care about the format of the messages that you put on the wire. We will enforce some message contracts and Steven's gonna tell us a little bit about that later. Um, but we could use RabbitMQ because of this as the connector between our Rails monolith, our new Elixir service and any other thing that we needed to integrate into our system. And I think that brings us to some of the details yeah of why or how rather we designed this system with Rabbit. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what we were trying to solve for because it's it's kind of like anytime you talk about microservices, which I've been carefully avoiding the word microservices because right. I feel like it's like a hot button issue. Yeah, we call them distributed services. Yeah, that's why I've been know, using the word yeah. distributed a lot. Also, I think it's accurate. Um, but anytime that you say, well, we've got this big app that technically works, that everyone knows how to dev on, that we know how to deploy. Right. Uh, let's start peeling things out of it and building new systems mm -hmm. and new services. That's really scary. That's a not a low level of engineering effort. So what were some of the goals that we had in mind if we were going to move to this new system? Yeah, so we saw the team was growing. We wanted to, to figure out a way to write, um, to integrate existing Elixir and Ruby applications. We also wanted to give ourselves a space to experiment some yeah. as well. Um, so we tried to figure out we said that the way forward is through some sort of standardization, right? We've got to make it easy to join. We've got to have an easy way to join our network, an easy way to make sure that the contracts are communicated across all of our applications. And um, using Rabbit, focusing on Rabbit as the backbone for that, let us essentially bring in uh, the first bit of work was kind of connecting that Bursar application to the main monolith, but it also let us spin up course management mm -hmm. pretty easily. Um, it also let us build that app in a very weird way and it was fine because it was small enough where it's sort you know port, uh, responsibilities are pretty small and if you just have to get in there and read that kind of like untangle the modeling that was there you could 
and it wasn't too much of a lift. Uh, if we wound up doing that with two massive monoliths, which I think is like the, the worst case scenario here, um, it would have been a lot harder. Yeah, that app was our organization's first Greenfield Elixir application. Right. So it got weird because we didn't totally know what we were doing yeah, at the time, exactly. but it was like a safer, smaller environment to play in. Right. Limited footprint in terms of if there was damage. I would say limited blast radius. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant <laughs> to say. But yeah, but, but I think that that's one of the nice things, right? Like being able to, um, one of the promises that we get by thinking my distributed systems, microservices, if you will, is that we do get to use the right tool for the right job. We use graph databases, we use time series databases. We can experiment off at the side. And it's, what we wound up building is this thing that small systems that emitted facts over the line mm -hmm. and said, this thing happened. Don't worry about how it happened or what the input was, it happened. Um, and started to kind of like sur surround the uh, sources of truth with this app logic. Um, so some of the goals that we wanted to, to uncover were, as I mentioned, easy to join the system, right? And we said that Rabbit is pretty good at this already because there are a ton of clients um, for any language you can imagine. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure that the messages could be consumed by anybody on that system. So the way we got around that is, um, again, we used Rabbit to make sure that we could connect and you know make new channels and publish to exchanges and, and subscribe to different queues. Um, we used Google protobufs to make it really easy to enforce those contracts. So we decided what the facts were that we would emit from these applications. Um, but we did want to codify some norms. So having a rabbit client is nice, but we, we want to make sure that everyone is publishing the same way. Everyone is consuming the same way. We want to make it easy to, for the developers to pick up a library and say, I'm interested in this set of facts because I can then integrate them to do something new and interesting in my system. So some norms for the publishers were we publish the fan out exchanges. So a fan out exchange gives us the nice, gives us pub sub essentially, right? So I can just say, Hey, a student was registered in this cohort. And anyone who's interested for giving access, for sending emails, for um, adding a student to Slack, if you will, can subscribe and, and, and do something interesting with that. Um, we wanted to generate predictable exchange names. So the idea of, you know, I'm, I'm publishing something for um, a registration entity or yeah, registration entity or even like a student identity entity, we would have a predictable name where you could publish those messages to. Um, we handled encoding on the publishing side. So we would say, all you have to do is, you know, get a protobuf ready and just publish that. We'll handle encoding it and adding metadata to uh, different parts of the message so that on the other end it can be handled. And on the consumer side, we uh, automatic, automated the creation of durable queues. And this is huge because I think that um, a durable queue is a queue that will continue to hold on to messages if the uh, consumer is down for some reason. So either you disconnect, um, but also the server crashes too. It stores them in DETS. Um, so the messages don't get lost. This is a huge deal that if a message was put on the line and someone was set to consume it, it would be there for them when they came back or even when the system came back if it did get catastrophic. Um, that, again, generating predictable queue names on the other side of that. So we know um, how to debug that this is from this application caring about this entity. Um, handled binding queues to exchanges so some of the, the lower level rabbit stuff, decoding messages, and then just essentially uh, giving you just the data that came across the wire. And then also for both sides, built some DSLs for mapping a message came in from this exchange for this event, handle it, which was really nice. So all of this was like built into basically an internal library proprietary framework right? so that the users of the system, which were other developers within our organization, wouldn't have to worry about any of that stuff, creating queues, creating exchanges, making sure it's a fan out exchange, figuring out encoding right. and decoding. All of that was built into the framework so that it would sort of be a no brainer. And it really scratched the itch that we were dealing with when we were using RabbitMQ as a background job processor, which was every time we wanted to start dealing with a new message, the same amount of engineering effort was required to right. structure the message, encode the message, decode the message, figure out how we wanted to process right. it and handle failure. We were still using Rabbit, but we took what we learned from using it kind of in an ad hoc manner yeah. to build a lot of that abstracted way into a framework. Right, right. And then the protobus added another le level of transparency to, so you could go and see what messages your system was actually emitting and who was consuming them, which was really nice. Um, you had exemplary um, protobus and you could say, my message is kind of similar to this. So now we started mm -hmm. to develop those good habits. We baked in metadata, mm -hmm. context data, 
into every um, message so you could tack on additional data. Um, and it, it grew really nicely organically because we had a good body of, of those messages that people could lean on to build their messages. Um, so that was great. Um, in practice, we would emit these facts over an exchange and consumers would integrate those facts. Um, this is kind of like the secret superpower of this whole thing is that the source of the fact is never revealed. It doesn't right? matter. It doesn't the matter. The consumer doesn't care whether an event originated from this app or that one or the GitHub API or Stripe or exactly. whatever. Right. So if we say it happened, if it came across the line that it happened, then it happened, right? If for some reason we changed how a student is done with an assignment, if it's not when they submit a pull request on GitHub, it was instead when they clicked on a button, all the consumers that care about that completion could just listen for that message on an exchange. Uh, this was super useful because it allowed us to uh, start peeling responsibilities away from the monolith and move it towards one of our other applications that we felt was a better fit for being the source of truth of when a student is registered in a class. Um, so originally the monolith handled everything. If you were registered, it gave you access and everything. Um, but now we have this other system that was handling billing and handling registration that once you've passed a certain threshold, either our admissions officer sends you an email and you click on the accept button, well, then you are registered for that class. That is the point in the life cycle of a student where that becomes a fact. We then emit that on the line. It handles access on the on the in the monolith, um, but also other things were consuming this message as well, um, and they didn't know that we swapped it out. I mean, they knew because we talked. We weren't that big of a team, but their systems didn't know, which was nice. Um, and that decoupling was really really powerful for us because the consumers didn't care. So I mentioned that we wound up moving towards uh, more Elixir systems. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about. How the be how the you benefit by using the beam, but what were some of the big wins we got by, I guess, using way more Phoenix and Gen servers and supervisors and sort of like all of these primitives that you get by just using a beam based language. Yeah, I think um, you really touched on it already when you talked about how we chose to use durable queues. Mm -hmm. So RabbitMQ is a very good citizen of the beam and it very much subscribes to this philosophy of let it crash. When you use a durable queue, if every single consumer in your system dies, right? If the end of the world happens um, to extreme. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything to the consumers, but should they die just, you know, through no fault of my own, those messages aren't going anywhere. Like you said, they get written to an ETS table, um, which is Erlang term storage. And when consumers come back online, they'll just start consuming messages mm -hmm. again. So that means that we could build Elixir systems that were really resilient and leverage supervisor trees to burn things down when we needed to without any fear of losing our messages. Um, so I think we really learned that Rabbit and Elixir are kind of a match made in heaven. Also, I already pointed this out to Steven, but I chose to use a purple heart here because that's like the Elixir color, right? Oh, so I have a red heart, which would be I, traditional. I get it. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> RapidMQ lets us decide how to deal with messages that the system can't process. Uh, you can act a message, even if you can't process it, you can decide I'm going to act it and move on to the next message. Let's say you've determined it's garbage for whatever reason. Right. Uh, it was encoded improperly. There's nothing you can ever do about that if you right. can't decode it. So get rid of it and move on. Uh, but we also oftentimes would lean on knacking messages to just put them back onto the queue to be retried. You might want to do this. Um, I guess if you have what you would consider to be like a transient failure, maybe there's a third party API dependency, you've hit a rate limit, you just want to put it back right. on the queue and try again. Yeah. Um, this is the beauty of let it crash, right? Yeah. Like, let's say there's just some like lock contestant contesting that happened. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know what? I could figure out to like loop and check and pull to get, it. or I could just throw it back on the queue and then just try again later. Yeah. And, and if something crashes as a result of it not having been able to, um, process that message, whether you knacked it or just didn't act it, it's still on the queue. Right. And when that consumer comes back up, you just do it again. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we really felt like Rabbit and Elixir added up to elegant and sophisticated failure mm -hmm. strategies. It's a lovely turn of phrase. Okay. So we used Elixir supervision trees to control the failure behavior that we wanted. We would decide which kinds of errors we should recover from by like letting things crash and letting them come back up and which should let things crash and keep them down. And this was kind of controversial because when you brought up this idea to me, I was like, this makes no sense. Like if, if the consumer crashes, why would I want it to affect the right. rest of the system? So would you like to defend yourself? At yes. This time? yes. On trial. Yeah. Um, there are, there's integrity issues that kind of the beam sort of solves, right? Like the, the beam has this concept of linking processes. 
So the idea is that like this process and this process have to both be working well because they are a system of, of uh, servers that rely on each other, either for data or I rely this thing to be up to do its job. Mm -hmm. The same concept can be extended um, to consumers because if, if I'm consuming, say, a student registered event and I crash, and then some other consumer is saying, uh, you know, this student is not only registered, but they've also paid, but I never registered the register event. Well, now this other consumer is going to fail in a weird way at a distance. It's going to mm -hmm. say, oh, I don't know where this, I don't have a record of the mm -hmm. student. The student never made it in. Who are you talking right. about? Or we give a student access to something that they like maybe didn't actually pay for right. because this message failed to get processed. But over here, this consumer is kind of like still right. tooling along and doing its thing. Exactly. Yeah. So we wind up in the state where we, we can, we had to uh, design a way to define a set of scoped consumers to say like the, this pocket of consumers must all work all the time. And if any of them fails, blow the whole system up, mm -hmm. investigate mm -hmm. immediately see what's going right. on. This would be something that would like page the person that's right. on call and a human would intervene. And some things that we saw where someone updated a message contract and didn't communicate it mm -hmm. well there, or they sent the weird version of something. Um, it could be that some bad data wasn't integrated or integrated poorly. Mm -hmm. um, and those are all things that, you know, are good to get a sign of early because it lets you know your system is in a weird state. So you can go fix it. You know, you got to go into console and maybe like add, add some data, mm -hmm. reprocess a message after pu uh, pushing uh, a code update, but it's definitely the right time to not continue to let that bad data do damage to your system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually similar to the way that we have it. This whole system really inspired me in the way that we're, my team is designing something at GitHub now, which sadly is not using Rabbit, so maybe I shouldn't talk about it, it's using Kafka, but it's very much the same idea. I was able to make a similar case that like, if this message can't mm. be processed, I do want it to crash, I do want it to back up, in this right. case, the stream, I do want it to alert people, and that's okay, because in the case of Kafka, we wouldn't commit the offset and it stays in the stream, but I kind of pulled that understanding from how we built this with RabbitMQ, right. from this understanding of a durable queue, from this idea that it's totally safe to let something crash, to let a consumer stop, knowing that your messages aren't going anywhere if they're right. in a durable queue. And when you bring your system back to a healthy state, it's just going to keep going and right. it's going to catch up. Right. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. RabbitMQ makes it really safe to let your consumers crash because of the durable queue setting. So this was really critical to our ability to build out what Stephen described as a fact propagation system. Uh, we talked about this like student payment example or things getting out of sync. If we don't have a single source of truth, if the whole system relies on facts getting asynchronously communicated and consumed by different services in different ways at different times, we absolutely need the ability to control how things fail. Mm -hmm. To say that services A, B, and C do have some dependencies in their behavior on one another, they should fail together. Right. But D, E, and Z, not so much. Um, and working with Elixir supervisor trees, working with RabbitMQ and the durable queue setting, right. it gave us the ability to build a system exactly like that. Um, I think we talked about this stuff. So I think we'll conclude with Elixir and RabbitMQ, our winning combination by tuning RabbitMQ's queue settings, really just using the durable queue setting, which is like pretty straightforward. You didn't, we didn't have to figure out a lot. You just make a durable queue. Um, by reaching for Elixir supervision trees, we built a system that recovers when we want it to and fails safely how we want it to when we need it to. So bringing it home to our little wrap up. We started using RabbitMQ as our Ferrari to a horse race, right? We brought this really, really powerful message broker in just to process background jobs in our Ruby on Rails app. Um, but as the needs of our organization grew, more business domains, more users, a bigger uh, engineering team as well that needed to be able to work in a way that was less coupled, RabbitMQ helped us. It helped us build robust, scalable, and event-driven systems which we like all those things. RabbitMQ lets us control how to manage connections and resources. I think anybody in the audience today that's worked with it is familiar with using connections and channels and channel pools. Everything that you need to manage your resources wisely is there for you and any RabbitMQ client of the many that are out there. Uh, it lets us handle a variety of failures and it lets us handle how to send messages right. in that it kind of didn't care how we sent messages right. so we could enforce our own contracts. and build that into a framework from there. So as a result, we were really well on our way to a healthy distributed system that could continue to grow as our organization grew.
That's like smart for businesses. Any business minded people out yeah, there. Anybody who's interested in that business. Yeah. Uh, so I really think we've learned that if you find yourself peeling responsibilities out of a monolith, you're starting to move towards new services, new apps for new domains. RabbitMQ is such a great choice for a system like that, uh, especially RabbitMQ and Elixir. We're going to conclude with a picture of our two dogs together, who I thought of this while we were talking. They're different sizes, just like us. I don't, I don't see it. You're a lot bigger than me. And Charlie is a lot bigger than Moby. Just because I thought, you know, for our audience, if we've ever like given a talk together or if anyone's taken our workshops, like we're on our own. Computers, That's true. You look like a giant. I look like a normal sized person, but now everyone knows that I'm actually very small. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> thank you all uh, for coming along on this. I think we have some time for questions. Certainly feel free, John, to interrupt us if that's not the case. And yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Sophie and Stephen, for uh, an excellent talk. Uh, we do have some uh, questions uh, for you. So um, so we are, uh, do we have Warren Bruce Smith um, available to ask a, a question of Sophie uh, and Stephen? You can unmute yourself. Perhaps not. Okay, so let me ask the question anyway. Uh, with Rabbit, what was the average size for messages and how did you find performance on the bigger messages? That's a great question. I don't know the average size of the messages we put on the wire. Not, not very big. Right, we never tried to send any massively large binary data um, over the wire. It was mostly, mm -hmm. again, a lot of this uh, so it is it is binary data because it's sent right, as it's as our proto buff encoded yeah. um, as binary data, but we never send like images or anything mm -hmm. massive on it. So it was pretty fast and pretty speedy for our use case. We were able to just send uh, those encoded compacted messages mm -hmm. and never really ran into any significant delays. Yeah, I think that's one of the other benefits of working with proto buff is when you encode your proto buff. It gets a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, we never ran into any limitations. I don't remember the, there is a size limitation for the messages that you can put on the wire. I don't remember what it we, is. We never even. Like, yeah, it's definitely in the docs. Um, but I would say provided you're not trying to send assets, you're probably not going to run into it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is that talk about the streaming, new streaming uh, messages in the protocol that they're adding. The ending oh, there's keynote. a talk yeah. here. Yeah. Okay, so make perfect. sure you check that yeah, out. Check out the other talks on this topic today stuff thank you very much uh we have do we have dennis braun on on uh yes i only wanted to get an idea um what was for example the the, the average uh yeah amount of messages you uh you have i mean how much how much work where it have uh, to do on a on a good day <laughs> or also on a bad day yeah, I don't, again, don't remember our average throughput, but RabbitMQ is notoriously performant to handle a very high throughput. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think we have in the slides that it's like, a mil, we, it can support about a million messages a second. We never got that close. Yeah, personally. We, you know, I, I think even us trying to put way more messages on the line than were necessary, right? Mm -hmm. Part of building this ecosystem was, let's just be chatty about things that are valuable to our business that happened. Let's just put it on the line. Even if no one consumes it, mm -hmm. Rabbit will just see that if there are no consumers and just drop them, which mm -hmm. is fine. Um, but let's be really chatty. I mean, we, if we got to like a couple hundred messages a second, mm -hmm. maybe a thousand a second, yeah. that would be a lot. Yeah. But I think it set us up for massive growth, which yeah. is one of the reasons that we wanted to reach for it when we had it. Uh, so we have a question from Leon, Leon Dorfing, Dorfling, I think. Are you there? Ah, uh, yes, thanks. Um, I would like to know what type of infrastructure <clears throat> was deployed to support this solution? Yeah, so we had a managed RabbitMQ instance with CloudAMQP. Right. We had our independent services, inclusive of our monolith and a couple of individual Elixir applications deployed um, into AWS instances. I don't remember too much about the details of that infrastructure, but I know that we were managing it 
with Terraform. So we lean very heavily on config as code to deal with like any networking. Um, but it was pretty straightforward to handle the networking because it's kind of like a set and forget with Rabbit. Like right. you deploy your managed Rabbit instance, you know that if you're bringing a new service online, it needs to be networked to connect to that known instance. Right. And you're kind of done. Yep. Yeah. I think eventually we wound up with all of our services on Fargate on mm -hmm. AWS. Yeah, 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 we did. Um, but yeah, it was relatively trivial. One of the benefits of, of having this framework was part of the Terraform configs where mm -hmm. also you need Rabbit. Yeah. It's just kind of baked in that everything could emit or consume messages from this, this uh, event-driven system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, <coughs> Annie Questions. Bloomgren. Yeah. Um, are you using a multi-node cluster for this setup? Uh, originally we were, um, and then when we were managing it ourselves, and then I'm sure Claudia MQP does. But we did have a multi multi node setup originally running on Digital Ocean, um, and spread across different regions and had backups. I think we actually had three Rabbit servers running, and they were yeah. all, uh, you know, clustered and configured for high availability. Um, which again, if you expose yourself to you expose your your belly to the networking gods, they might. They might bite. Um, networks are hard. That was a weird metaphor, but you guys, I saw our dogs, you know? Um, <laughs> the, the idea of, again, like making, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. I have the network, I have reliability and backups, but I also have, I'm at the whim of like network latency. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question from um, uh, Joe Betka. Hi guys, uh, on a project I'm working on now, we looked into Protobuf and Avro and a couple other binary encoded ones, but we eventually went with JSON, partially because we just thought it would be easier to be able to go in the admin console and pull up a, a message and troubleshoot it. Did, did that end up being an issue for you or additional tooling you need there cause any friction? Yeah, I love this question. So like the RabbitMQ UI does have a portal where you can just paste in a message and fire it off. And so I definitely could understand feeling like having JSON messages is an easy way to leverage that tool because it's pretty easy to grab some JSON from pretty much wherever or make some JSON in your console and then paste it in there. Um, so we did feel the need eventually, this was kind of like a little further down the line as we were building out this system uh, we did feel the need to add in some tooling that would give us the ability to fire messages when we needed to. Cannonball, want to talk about it? God, yeah. So the idea was, originally this was a tool that was born out of uh, the need to test systems, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that facts happen off in the distance and my system will respond to a fact. Mm -hmm. But if I'm developing it and I don't originate the fact, how do I sort of do yeah, that? Without it being a huge pain to say, how do I like painstakingly recreate the message right. that this other service will send to me? We needed some local development tooling in other words, right. yeah. So we wound up building essentially something that would read the protobuf, design, you know, build a, a web form, and then you could submit sort of the things mm -hmm. through the appropriate exchange and the, yeah. uh, and then it would be consumed by the application. Um, we also built something else kind of like closer to your question, which was the railway UI. Yeah. Which would- I don't remember that. Yes, I do. You do, do you no, want to talk about it? Sort of. Okay, so we also built, um, a UI wrapper around this library that Stephen talked about that encoded or enshrined rather norms for publishers and consumers. And the UI would show you like, it kind of was heavily inspired by the rabbit UI, just giving you visibility into messages. So it would show you messages published uh, over queues, messages consumed over queues by certain com um, consumers. It would show the decoded messages and the payload of them. This was like in an admin UI so that you wouldn't have to worry about how do I get visibility into one of my messages just through the rabbit GUI? And um, again, because we were working with Elixir and Phoenix and LiveView, building up a, a web UI for local development tooling, building up an admin web UI for introspecting into the behavior of our messaging system was super fast and easy to do. I think in particular, Phoenix and LiveView let us be really productive in spinning up tooling for our team. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions. Um, I've got here, uh, what do you, what's a good resource for learning more about RabbitMQ and beyond uh, specifically the documentation, uh, which is uh, pretty good. Um, and I, uh, there's a second part to this. Um, 
what was what was your fan out and did you face any issues when uh, with your fan out when your fan out increased mm -hmm. resources first i guess yeah um i mean i think our workshop is pretty good yeah we do a workshop sometimes but it's not like on the schedule yeah right now i don't know maybe it will be um, but we've we've put together um, a workshop that shows you how to build essentially event driven systems with Elixir. The idea is like building greenfield applications, but truthfully, the concepts are um, pretty uh, generic and can be applied to any language. Yeah. Um, so request that at your next local local conference, and uh, and we'll see. Uh, I will say that the the truth is that the documentation is really really good. Yeah. Um, they do have a bunch of walk-alongs that you can do to kind of understand not only the rabbit concepts, but how to do it. Uh, I know that when we built RPC into the framework, it was basically lifted from the documentation. Yeah. Um, and it was like, this is really good. It does, it does sort of what it mm -hmm. needs to do. Also, I would say that like, I've, I've really only needed to reach for two sources when it has come to working with RabbitMQ and it's the RabbitMQ docs, which would be like number one. And then the cloud AMQP, just like blog and the resources that they yeah. have have also come in handy time and again. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe the fan out question. Uh, we, we didn't run into any noticeable slowdowns, but I, mm -hmm. I imagine that um, there might be some performance hits that yeah. happen at higher levels, in which case we would have to consider sharding mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of other strategies for that. Yeah, we didn't really get to that point though. Just stuff. how are we doing for time? Uh, I think we'll make this the last question. Um, was the latency of messages not an issue when you moved to a managed service? Yeah, I would say definitely not, right? No, I mean, yeah. I th I think that there's the um, people would by the time people went to the other system to sort of check something, mm -hmm. maybe our workflows didn't step on each other, or we partitioned it well enough where mm -hmm. an update in a UI, if it was a second behind, mm -hmm. you wouldn't notice. Um, so we we really didn't run into to that. One thing that I think would be um, if there was noticeable latency, like there was issues connecting to Cloud MQP, I think it would have made sense to start surfacing that. Like, hey, there is mm -hmm. there is a slowdown in, in sort of message I consumption. I mean, I think but... we had, because we had like, you know, a pretty standard setup, Datadog and PagerDuty, like right. we had alerts and monitors on latency like that. And we would get alerted if it happened. And I don't yeah. remember, I mean, certainly I remember getting pages and alerts, but that would have usually been like sev one, there's a bug and nothing's getting consumed right. versus like things are just weirdly a little slow and we don't know why. And yeah. I think, I don't think we really noticed taking a performance hit due to latency, just switching from self-managed to yeah. hosted. There's a second part to that. Uh, it, when you also transferred from a sort of monolith application to a microservices, did you get any latency there? Well, I mean, it was a it was a total paradigm shift, right? It was moving from things happening oftentimes synchronously or maybe just in a background job in the monolith to this idea of like decoupled fact propagation. Mm -hmm. So this idea that service A could emit a message that any number of services might care about and consume and act on in the future. And the kind of messages that we were sending tended not to be ones that a user would be like looking at and expecting I want to see something update before my very eyes right now. Right. It's more like a student has been successfully enrolled. So let's send the email that bills them or a student has been successfully billed. Right. Let's emit the message that adds them to the cohort and provisions them access to lessons. Um, so I think we chose it for things that were a really good fit for asynchronous mm -hmm. um, flows. I feel like I'm leaving something out though. I don't know, add something to that. Uh, no, that's great. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I think I think you're right that I think the, you know, typically the flow would be you would register a student, they would pay, and then mm -hmm. they would have access, but they would receive an email that tells them they now have access. So it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like we would drive a lot of the processes that worst case, if they were on the page and, you know, command, you know, mm -hmm. R-ing a bunch, yeah. they would, it would be slow from the, the moment they paid the right. Stripe invoice. Right. But I think it was, it wouldn't be as bad as, you know, to be like, this was unacceptable. I waited 33 seconds for exactly. my access. Yeah, right. It's not like student clicks a button and they expect the button to turn pink and it's taking an extra two seconds because the process right. that turns it pink is rapid. Um, I think we reached for asynchronous messaging to model a domain that was inherently asynchronous. Right. Yeah. 